Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Migrant Woman Reality Watch number 29. Um, I'm going to give a minute or two for people to get in and to be comfortable watching this, this conversation today. Um, but today, as you can see, I have with me uh, Pierre Pap and Mireia Crespo. I will present them shortly, but first I would like to, to give you some indications as to what is happening today. Um, so, as you know, the 25th of November was the International Day for the Elimination Against All Forms of Violence Against Women and Girls. And we decided at the European Network of Migrant Women to hold the Migrant Women Reality Watch series or to continue it. Uh, but to focus on, on the different forms of male violence. So today we are talking about prostitution as male violence. Um, it's a very important topic for us as a network uh, because we believe prostitution is one of the main violations of, um, of the human rights of uh, women and girls and particularly migrant women and girls. So this is why we are holding the conversation today. Um, as you know from our posts, and if you know us well, we are an abolitionist platform. This means that we are in a platform uh, led by migrant women, first of all, but a uh, migrant women that are against any form of sexual exploitation, um, be it human trafficking for the purposes of sexual exploitation, pornography, uh, prostitution, and, and other forms of sexual exploitation too. And we give a lot of rel relevance to this topic because the, the majority of women who are in prostitution are migrant women and girls. So we are overrepresented in this industry. And this is why we, uh, we clearly define ourselves as an abolitionist platform and our member as abolitionist members. Um, as usual, this, this video is being live streamed onto our Facebook page. This means that you can share, comment um, anytime that you want. The video is public, so you can share it onto your personal pages. But if you are uh, watching from the point of view of an organization, you can also share it on the organization's page. Later on, you will be uh, able to access this video on our YouTube channel. Um, you just have to type European Network of Migrant Women and you will see. And we invite you to share because not only this topic is very important, but today we will touch upon uh, various aspects of uh, prostitution in the context of Belgium. Um, so we, the, the two presenters that I have with me today are going to give you very powerful insight on, on the Belgian situation. And if you are lobbying or you, if you are undertaking any actions against prostitution in Belgium, we think that this, uh, this might be useful for you. Um, under the comment section, you can, you can ask questions to, to both Mireille and Pierrette. Um, I don't promise that we will have time to address all of these questions, but I will do my best to, to fill them uh, during our talk or at the end of our talk. Uh, so please be patient with us because it is not every day that we have more than one woman uh, being interviewed. So sometimes maybe it can take a little bit longer. Um, okay, so before we start, I'm just going to, um, to, um, to present or give a little bit of presentation to, to the two women that are with me today here. So you may or may not know her, but first we have with us Pierrette Papp. Uh, Pierrette Papp is now an individual member of, of the European Network of Migrant Women. And before she, before she, she was the, the director of ISALA, which is one of our members in Belgium. And uh, she was thus representing the organization. But today we also have Mireia, who is the new director of ISALA. Uh, so we have the ISALA team with us today. Uh, just to give you some words about Pierrette. So Pierrette is a feminist activist and professional. Uh, before she founded ISALA, she was the policy and campaigns director of the European Women's Lobby. So for those who don't know, the European Women's Lobby is the biggest umbrella organization uh, that advocates for women's rights in Europe and is based in Brussels. She was also the, the head of advocacy and the coordinator of the Global Survivor Network um, for the foundation of Dr. Denis Mukwege, um, which maybe she can touch uh, upon a little bit after. But um, this, this professor, this Dr. Denis Mukwege, has actually helped a lot of women uh, in Africa recover from, uh, from a lot of um, the effects of, of sexual violence that were imposed on them. Um, so yes, I will ask Pierre to, to give us a few words about that later on. 
uh, in parallel, and in addition to that, Pierrette was also involved in a lot of uh, grassroots feminist projects in Belgium. And in this framework, let's say, she founded ISALA, which is a frontline organization that is dedicated to supporting persons, uh, but mostly women, since women are the majority of, of prostituted people. Um, so dedicated to supporting these persons that were affected by, by sexual exploitation. We will also touch upon that, so I don't really want to give you too much spoilers. And moving on to Mireia, Mireia is Spanish. She has a background in communications and political science. Uh, she now lives in Belgium, where she joined uh, Isala first as a volunteer, uh, but now in the capacity of director. So we're very happy to see this, this transformation and how the power of an organization can actually open a lot of doors for women and for the help of women. So welcome to both of you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot for the invitation, and it's so great to be with Mireya also. <laughs> great. Mireya, can you hear us? Yes, I do. I hear you. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Welcome, Mireya, as well. I'm, I'm very happy. It's the first time that, that we host you on the Migrant Woman Reality Watch. So I'm particularly happy to be, to be with both of, of you today. And uh, we already have some comments from the audience saying hello to you and, and thanking for 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 we will be talking about today. So without taking much more time, um, I would like to ask you both uh, to present yourselves because of course what I, what I did was a mini intro as, as to, to the amazing work that you both do. Um, so first I wanted to, uh, yeah, to ask you if you could present yourselves, what do you do as your work as the um, as co-founder and director of Isala respectively? And if you could also present a bit the organization that is ISALA for, for the public that isn't really aware of, uh, of what it is or what it does. Um, and yeah, maybe I can, ask, I can start with you, Pierrette. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, we, we talked together with Mireya and then uh, indeed the idea would be that I could explain also why ISALA was created. And then Mireya will let you know uh, in more details what ISALA is doing on on the front line every day. So as you said, I worked for 10 years at Europe and at the international level, leading advocacy and campaigns against violence against women, sexual exploitation and sexual exploitation and sexual violence in conflict with the Nobel Peace Prize laureate, Dr. Mukwege. And in parallel, I was an activist in many uh, women's organizations in Belgium. I gave French classes to migrant women. I contributed to, uh, with articles to a feminist journal. I was the spokesperson for the World March of Women uh, in a small activist group uh, denouncing sexist advertising. And so those experiences gave me both an international perspective on women's rights, especially prostitution, and also grassroots experience and passion for social action, for social change, for movement building. And working on the European resolution towards the abolition of prostitution with the European Parliament, which passed, which I'm very happy, I needed at the same time to develop a local and concrete action uh, towards women and girls trapped in the system of prostitution, all the more that Belgium was more and more um, giving space to pimps and less and less respecting its international commitments. Uh, so we will talk about that later. Uh, but we other activists, we felt an urgent need to create a grassroots organization uh, dedicated to supporting persons in prostitution, starting with the social work. And this is how Isala was created in 2013. And Isala is the name of um, Isala Van Dist, who is the first um, doctor and universitarian in Belgium. Uh, so it's an inspiring name because uh, it's a very strong feminist. And she also created shelters for persons in prostitution. So it's a very symbolic name. And so uh, I was amongst the co-founders of Isala. I was the president for the first seven years. And what was very important for me was really to develop this frontline action uh, to make sure that we would become credible uh, before starting to do advocacy. Uh, and especially in Belgium, because in Belgium at that time and already now, there's a lot of uh, space for uh, the sex industry voice and lobbies. And um, uh, we wanted to make sure that we are strong uh, based on what we do. So the first five years, and Mireya will tell you more, we developed the real work going on the streets, providing assistance, opening a, a safe house. And um, it's, for me, it was very important that uh, we are really doing the work on the ground. Uh, and it brought me so much, this volunteer work, because 
it gave me strength in my advocacy work. When I was uh, doing advocacy, I could really talk about the reality. I was not just about values and data. And also learning from the women we are meeting. Uh, it's an amazing experience in terms of um, uh, realizing their resilience, understanding better the system of prostitution, being more subtle in the way we can talk about it, uh, and especially being uh, driven and inspired by uh, their strength and their dreams. So that's something that is a, a very inspiring experience. And that's why, uh, for me, Isala brought a lot. And I hope uh, and I wish long life to Isala. <laughs> long life for the, for the volunteers and hopefully not so much a long life if we have uh, less prostitution, of course. Thank you so much. I am uh, I'm also a proud volunteer of Isala. <laughs> so I, I also wish long life to to the effort that the that the volunteers bring to the bring to the organization and to the work that we do. Um, but of course we don't we don't wish long life to the to the flourishing and lasting sex industry in Belgium. So I very much relate to what you say. What about you, Mireille? Um, thank you, thank you very much for the for the invitation, Adriana. So yes, uh, now I'm currently the director of Isala. Uh, although I joined as a volunteer and uh, my mission today is really to support um, the, the team of volunteers uh, to carry out, uh, to carry out uh, the, the work that Isala does. Together with uh, another colleague in the Secretariat, we are only two, uh, two paid uh, workers, right? Um, it's, uh, for me, it's, it's, it's a very, uh, very important thing. It's, it's really, Isala is really a group of uh, 20, uh, 25 to, to nowadays it's like 25 to 30 active people that are um, every week go on the streets to meet the prostituted uh, pe uh, persons that uh, welcome them during the drop, drop in hours every week and that uh, assist them with their different demands in order to help them to find concrete alternatives to prostitution. And this is, uh, this is very valuable. We are a team of women and men with very different backgrounds that are engaged in, in uh, taking action um, against uh, the, the system uh, of violence that represents prostitution. And as Pierre said, we also have um, a transit house, which is like a shelter that can um, again, um, has place for two women that are exiting prostitution and that really offers them the opportunity to get some rest and to get, uh, to put some distance between the, um, between the, the world of prostitution and, and to really be able to, um, to, 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 to take care of themselves and, and rebuild, uh, a life project, the life project that they choose, uh, choose to, um, um, to, to build, right? Um, to give you to give you some numbers uh, in a nutshell, in during a normal year, right? Because we have been uh, we have been of course touched by by the COVID crisis since uh, since last year. But during a normal year, we would uh, do uh, more than seven hundred meetings. We would hold uh, more than fifty uh, drop-in sessions. And we would go um, more than 80 times uh, in the streets. So, so this represents like a lot of, uh, of volunteer hours and lots of, of, of paid work as well. Um, in, the, in the past years, uh, we have on average uh, supported uh, 20 people, uh, 20 women um, uh, in, um, um, in terms of, of a long, uh, long, long-term uh, support, right? Which means that um, since Isala was um, uh, was able to to go on the streets and, and to welcome the women in in our in our offices, we've been able to help uh, more than uh, eighty women uh, to exit to exit prostitution. Uh, this is um, this is of course done with with very little resources. Uh, but with uh, the motivation of, of uh, committed, uh, committed uh, women and, and men. Thank you. If, if there are people in the audience who didn't know Isala before, I think that both of you gave a, a pretty good and, and clear explanation. Um, I will be sharing also throughout the talk the, some resources that Isala has come up with 
uh, in their website and their social media so you can follow and have a more detailed look at what uh, what the work that Isala that Miraya just described uh, really is about and I really encourage you to uh, also support the organization because yeah uh, organizations that are led by by women first of all don't have a lot of funding and when it comes to the to the sexual exploitation of women uh, we also struggle a lot with you know uh, resources and being able to provide the things that the women need um, so this is a need a real need from from the organizations on the ground working at grassroots level so this is why I'm doing this little bit of publicity but Thank you so much, and I will I will be sharing throughout the talk uh, more information about Isala uh, while you women expose some of the some of the things that I will ask you. Um, okay, so now that we have a little painting of what Isala is um, and what Isala works towards for or towards the abolition of, um, I wanted to ask you, uh, Pierrette, please. Um, to talk more about the the contribution that you did for our migrant woman uh, mental health and well-being report uh, for the audience that is listening to us uh, a couple months ago uh, the european network of migrant women we we published a, a report that that delved into the mental health and the well-being of migrant women um because we we realized and and we know this by experience as well that if the mental health of women in general is already so disregarded and so understudied, let's say, the mental health and well-being of migrant women uh, was even more. And there were a lot of um, there are a lot of effects on the mental health and well-being of migrant women that are caused by male violence. And we wanted to make sure that in this report it came really as crystal clear that prostitution did have serious effects both on the mental and the physical health of migrant women and girls. So Pierrette, you gave us your contribution uh, in regards also to the to the experience, the grassroots experience that you have at Isala uh, about the consequences of male violence in prostitution, but also in the women when they exit prostitution. So I was wondering, since you have such an extensive experience accompanying this these women uh, that are victims of the prostitution system, if you could give us a little bit of an overview on the consequences of the prostitution of women, both in and out, and more or less your, your conclusions or your insight of what you have uh, observed at, at, at local level, but also in, mostly in Belgium, but also the uh, prostitution in, in the more general sense. Thank, Thank you. you. And I would encourage everyone to read the report that Adriana mentioned. And in the report, you also have a testimony of, um, of one of the women we, uh, we have um, followed at Isala, and she very well, describes uh, her situation and the, the link between male violence, prostitution and the mental health impact. And that's what I want to start with. Uh, when we talk about prostitution as a form of violence, it's very important to understand that there's a continuum of violence um, that leads uh, to prostitution or fosters prostitution. Um, many uh, research and reports all over the world show that um, many women have uh, experienced violence before entering prostitution. Um, can be um, very bad uh, mental, like psychological um, violence from the family, can be rape or incest in the childhood, can be um, domestic violence too. And uh, this is something that is often invisible, but it's very important to understand that it's also part of the strategy of the perpetrators and of the PIMS to find out the most vulnerable women in terms of the, the lack of self-esteem that they might be facing now because of the violence they, they experienced in the past. And uh, the, and you have uh, interesting documentaries that talk about uh, the strategies of the PIMS, uh, El Proxeteneta, uh, a Spanish movie, but uh, Le Commerce du Sex, which is also another movie from Quebec, they really show how the PIMS, uh, and this is what they're doing today on the social networks, on the social media, they are trying to find the young women who feel a bit distressed, alone, lonely, and this is how they trap them. So there's a lot of violence before entering prostitution because sexual violence in general, male violence in general, affects us all and affects our self-esteem. And if you have uh, a vision of your own body and your, of your own self-esteem that is so damaged, um, you might be more vulnerable to the arguments of the sex industry. If you add on top of that um, poverty, of course, that's, uh, there's a high 
um, probability that the pimps are going to come to you and, and manipulate you. There's a lot of violence in prostitution, and that's also studies uh, that tell us that. But we, as Isala, we have seen it. We have heard it from the women uh, we accompany. Um, violence from the pimps, violence from the buyers, the sex buyers, violence from the police, interestingly. Um, the police who's supposed to... Um, care for people, but uh, just make the most of um, the situation of those women. And um, highlighting the fact that, as you said, the majority of women in prostitution are migrant women, many of them having no migration status, legal migration status. This is a, an even easier situation for pimps and buyers and anybody to just attack them because uh, they have no recourse, no resort um, to get some support and help and justice. And that's very, uh, that's really what the system of prostitution, of prostitution is trying to maintain the a situation of isolation, like a world besides the world we live in, where there's no law, uh, whereas there is. And then this is what we were doing at Isala, reminding the women that uh, we are all in the same society and they, they should have access to the same rights. And there's violence after exiting prostitution. And this violence takes the form of um, uh, some mental health problem you were referring to, physical problems that women uh, suddenly face because their body is out and they, they, they have made a shift in their, mental, in their minds and suddenly they take care maybe better of their body and they realize that uh, this body has been dissociated when they were in prostitution and they were not taking care of it and this type of violence is very invisible people don't understand and that's what i've been trying to say in the report people don't understand or don't want to understand the long life consequences of sexual violence whether it's rape, sexual violence in prostitution, all types of sexual violence, you are affected as a person because your bodily integrity has been attacked and uh, it has long-term consequences, but society is not ready to accept that. And people just want uh, just want to forget about it. And yeah, you know, you were raped yesterday. Okay, let's go back to life now. You're smiling today. Everything is fine. But what we are doing at Isala and any abolitionist organization is really to maintain the relationship with the woman to make sure that uh, they will always find somebody when they are feeling down, where they are sad, because we know that it's very difficult to, um, to be uh, uh, really back on track and, and strong. It's really affecting deeply people. And at Isala, we organize a lot of uh, creative activities to open up to joy, to fun, to, to find new ways to, um, to love oneself because that's really a, a bit it's a lot about uh, regaining the possibility to say I this is what I want and so this continuum of violence which is before during after it's personal continuum but it's also a society continuum because there's violence against women at all ages of life there's violence against all types of women um, and prostitution is amongst that. So prostitution doesn't happen to a very specific group uh, and very specific situation. It can happen uh, all the more when society just normalizes it so much. It can happen to everybody, like violence against women happens to everybody. And that's where we talk about this collective continuum that we women, we face uh, just because we are women. And as long as there are any form of violence still exists, there's a risk that the other forms of violence are going to come in and they're going to be maintained in society. So as long as there's impunity for at least one form of violence, we are um, allowing for impunity to happen for other forms of violence. Uh, and the, co the collective consequences are very basic. If one woman, uh, if it's okay to buy sex from one woman, it means it can be okay to buy from any other woman because uh, the mentality associated is that men are entitled to. So why uh, would it not be okay to ask for any woman? And that's why we are abolitionists, which means we want to abolish um, the system of prostitution and change mentalities. We know it's going to get time. Uh, we are not prohibitionists. We are not asking to prohibit things by the law, but we are really trying to make people understand it's a mentality. And I will mention that, for example, this is an example I like to give today, a young boy who is growing up in the uh, Netherlands uh, is going to see like a shop with food, a shop with books, a shop with uh, whatever, jeans, and he's going to be a shop with women. So this is also this type of mentality we need to change. Whereas a young boy who is growing up in Sweden, we've been told that you cannot 
still you cannot beat people, you cannot trap, and you cannot buy. And that makes a whole difference in terms of mentality. So that's why it's important to uh, understand the links between prostitution and violence. And uh, the trafficking of women is a means to get women into the stem of prostitution and just perpetrate the violence. So all of that has to be taken into account um, together. Thank you, Pierrette, and especially for, for bringing light to the continuum of violence, which is something that I feel is not very much understood or paid attention to, uh, sometimes even within the, some feminist organizations. Uh, I think it's very important to state that prostitution is not an isolated event, is not an isolated dynamic that, that, um, that just happens because some men buy sex. It's a, it's a system that is entrenched inside a patriarchal system as well and it's it's a continuum as you said because it feeds off uh from other forms of violence and if um, i may um i just wanted to make the link because you mentioned my work at the dr mukwege foundation so dr mukwege uh, has been a strong advocate against the use of uh, rape as a weapon of war and it's very interesting to see that people agree understand that rape is a weapon so if we use the same analysis, we have to understand that um, the system of prostitution is also understood as a weapon to perpetrate, to continue the impunity. And if we agree that uh, we have to denounce as much rape in war as, you know, chemical arms and other types of uh, torture in war, it means we understand that um, raping or uh, having access to somebody's body is not, um, uh, it's not neutral, it's deliberate and it has an impact on people. So I, I really wanted to stress that because we, we tend to also want to separate the forms of violence from each other, but it's, it's the same logic. Thank you. Sometimes it looks like I'm taking a lot of time to respond, but I, we are actually turning each other's mics because there is some interference between the, the three of us. So please bear with us and, and be patient with us. <laughs> um, I just wanted to, before I ask a question to Mireya, I just wanted to, to ask Pierrette, why do you think then that people really conceive, um, that people don't conceive prostitution as, as sexual violence? Um, I think today it's a mix between um, this usual thing, it has always existed, like making people have a, uh, leading people to have a, like a step back on how society works. It's always difficult, uh, I think in general, people that like just see the way it is and don't question and secondly we are in a very consumerist society so people don't look at money as a um, means of oppression or a means of inequality so they would say uh, oh there's money so there's equality but if you really think of it uh, if there's money it means somebody has money and somebody hasn't and somebody needs it because if it's about two people having sex you don't need money to have sex if you have uh, a desire from both sides, you can have sex. In that case, uh, the money is buying the desire of the other person because, um, and this is Kat Banyard who was saying that very clearly, if uh, if the man were uh, asking the woman and uh, she would probably say no by putting the money, especially towards a woman who is in situation of need, of course, then you don't, you don't get a no, you don't get a yes. You just get what you want, but you are uh, exploiting someone. You are just making the most of somebody's vulnerability. And uh, and the problem is that um, uh, it's very difficult to make people understand that there are many ways of uh, domination and money is one of them in that situation. My last uh, analysis would be that it's because the majority of victims are women and we live in a very patriarchal society. And I guess, uh, as many of feminists puts it, if it were men being exploited or men having no access to abortion or, you know, it, things would change uh, in a society where men have the power. And we know that uh, all type of men buy sex, but including men in power. And uh, this is part of uh, what it means to be a powerful man is also to have access to many women. And so we are faced with, uh, we are facing this uh, obstacle from decision makers. Uh, to really, really uh, make progress. So that's really good to see countries who are making steps towards abolition, like uh, France recently, Ireland, because uh, it, it really shows that we can change mentalities. Mm -hmm. Regarding those steps towards abolition, um, we wish that with this Migrant Woman Reality Watch, we would be 
bringing good news uh, regarding Belgium, but unfortunately we are not. Miraya will tell us more about that later on. Um, but it seems that our feminist uh, dream or hope of of Belgium being, you know, uh, kind of a safe haven or at least a country where prostitutional violence is not exerted on women and girls is a bit far away from from what we hope, despite the the decades of, of feminist effort and and combat that that women have been having. But I will not precipitate myself, and and we will touch upon that later on. Uh, thank you so much, Pierrette. Mireya, I was hoping we could connect uh, with what uh, Pierrette just said. We were talking about the, the mental health report, right? And health is a very, very important part of the of uh, Isala's action. Um, so I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more on the pillar that, that is health within Isala. And um, based on your experience and what you what you see on the ground on your work every day with uh, with women in and out of prostitution, what would you say are the most uh, visible effects of male violence on the health of prostitution women? Um, and if if those effects, you know, do they stay with the woman that is out of prostitution? Do they go back? Are they intergenerational? What is more or less the the state of of the health of prostituted women and and what do you observe on, on the ground? Yes, uh, so I, I would like to start by um, talking a bit of who are the women that come uh, to Isala, uh, what, are, what are their demands? And um, as, as Pierrette was saying, um, the, the women that come, uh, come to, to, uh, to see us are, are part of the most marginalized group, right? They, uh, they, uh, they are migrant women, they are women with children, uh, they, uh, they are often without papers, uh, without a legal status in Belgium, um, and they often have fled their countries of origin because um, they, they were living in very poor uh, conditions and, and they came here looking for a better life, right? Um, a lot of these women, they, they live in, in houses that are unhealthy, unsafe. They have very, very little access to, uh, to decent homes. And uh, they have, of course, very low incomes or non-income at all, um, which uh, makes it impossible for them uh, to uh, provide for themselves or, or for, their, for their families. And... Um, uh, without without mentioning that most of of them either don't speak the language or don't uh, don't uh, can't read or, or write it right, which is a very very uh, uh, important step in order to have access to the to the job market in Belgium. Um, so um, so of course these women uh, have health issues and and we see it when they come to to visit us. Um, I just to to, to give you uh, examples of um, of the. Of some cases that we have had uh, recently in the past months, uh, we have seen uh, dental problems, we have seen throat problems, we have seen uh, sleeping disorders, uh, anxiety disorders, um, chronic fatigue, um, uh, stress. Um, there is, um, there is, for instance, one uh, one uh, woman that has, has hasn't been able to come and visit us. She has called. She called every week uh, to uh, rebook an appointment. Um, but she, the moment she, she has to come, she, she isn't able to get out of her bed, right? So, so this is the, the, the daily, uh, the reality that, that we are facing, uh, that we are facing uh, on a daily basis. And um, the truth is that, that health comes, uh, uh, is, is a demand or a topic that will always come at some point in the, throughout the, the, the support that we give to, to these women. Uh, and it's often uh, a moment when they, are able to tell themselves, uh, yes, like now I can really take care of myself, which is isn't uh, which isn't uh, uh, always the case, right? When you have to worry about uh, paying your rent or buying, uh, being able to, to feed your children, uh, well, you, sometimes you, you tend also to neglect your, your own health. And uh, the way we address uh, we address this in. Uh, in Isala is um, also the way we address uh, any other demand um, is uh, first of all by 
um, by uh, working with a lot with partners, actually. We don't want to uh, uh, be uh, an, an organization that has all solutions for the women that come. We want to always work in, uh, in partnership with other associations and, and actors that um, are in, um, um, yeah, that are in the, the social, the social uh, sphere in Belgium. And uh, we have partnerships with uh, psychologists, for instance, that speak several languages. Uh, we have partnerships with um, medical centers. We have partnerships with uh, centers or organizations that are specialized in um, pregnancies, for instance, or that accompany mothers with their children. So um, the idea is to really uh, um, to, to prioritize giving quality support to these women and to be able to, to use our different expertises in order to uh, to support them uh, uh, to support them uh, in the best way. Um, so um, you mentioned also the the children and, and the, the families. Uh, we support indeed several uh, several uh, teenagers whose uh, mums were in prostitution or are in prostitution. And our first uh, concern, our first worry, and our first objective uh, in supporting them is that they don't um, they don't get trapped in the same paths uh, as their mothers. And this is not always a, 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 an easy job, right? Because um, as you can imagine, if the moms don't have papers, well, the children won't have papers either. If um, they are always, uh, they are often um, out of school. There is also the language barrier. Most, um, uh, lots of them don't speak uh, don't speak uh, French. So, um, so, um, so yeah. Our, our demand really is that in order to protect this this uh, this children and, and this uh, young young girls. Uh, we need to, to protect the, 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 their mothers, right? Um, and uh, in order to put, protect their mothers, the first step is to offer them uh, a legal status in, uh, in, uh, in Belgium because that's what, uh, that's what uh, will recognize um, that they have been victims of, of the of prostitution of the system uh, uh, of the system of, of prostitution. Um, the only uh, the only way that uh, they will have access to basic social rights is that they have uh, access to a legal status in Belgium. And then from now from then on, uh, um, of course, there are there are other aspects. Right? It's not it's not only the fact that, that they have papers that they can. Uh, that that uh, uh, yeah, it's not the solution for everything, but it's it's a, uh, it's a first step. It's a fundamental step in order to to give them um, access to basic rights, uh, ac access to training as well, right? Access to uh, learning friends, access to uh, um, uh, being able to yeah, to to to, uh, to enroll the children, the children to to school, um, to to uh, to a decent to a decent house, right? So so this is. Um, uh, what we're trying to um, to support this this women with um, throughout our work. You you mentioned um, I th I think here we we should also make a little bit a uh, distinction between like the the immediate health concerns that these women have, for example, uh, teeth problems because this is something that keeps them all at night and it's not something that they can postpone. But when it comes to really taking care of their mental health at a deeper level, this is something that takes more, much more time. As Pierrette was saying, the the mm -hmm. reappropriation of who you are, of your desires, of your of your needs, um, is this something that that speaks to you, or or am I sure. very very far off? Yeah. No, sure. Um, there is um, th that is why for us it's very important also to offer long term support. It's not because one uh, when a uh, woman has exited prostitution that we say goodbye, uh, you're not anymore welcome here. Um, we we continue the support. We continue to see uh, uh, these women, and it's often once they have uh, regained um, uh, regained the 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 power about their their life projects that they will accept maybe to see a psychologist to say okay there's there's now I have time for myself. Um, but um, but of course it's it's very it's it's really a long term work a long term support and we can only do that by building uh, trust relationships with them. Uh, it's only because they feel uh, they feel good coming to Isala because they feel listened to because they don't feel judged 
that they can that they accept to, to be helped by us and that they accept our our support right um so um so yeah i don't know if i answered your question yes totally totally and i think it's it's very important what you say because um i think that there's a lot of organizations or even individuals that think that once a woman is out, is out of prostitution, then everything is perfect, like, like Pierrette was saying as well. And I, I think it's, it's very important to emphasize on the long-term support. And this is one of the things that I find very unique at Isala is also that this support is not given just like that, is based on the demands and the really careful analysis of the needs of the women. What are they saying? You also have to read between the lines. So I think that's that's a work that, that both of you have really mastered as well. Like, what is this woman really saying if she has headaches, if she has stom stomach aches, if she can't sleep at night? So, so yeah, yes, you have responded perfectly. So, I, I forgot, yeah, so, so just to, to add something is that, um, um, it's of course it's super key to uh, to to know very well um, what are the signs and the symptoms, right? Uh, especially when uh, social uh, social workers are in more general institutions, uh, and that and so, so it's it's very important um, that they are equipped with the knowledge uh, in order to to be able to to support this to identify right someone that might be in prostitution or not, and then to offer. Uh, uh, quality support and quality quality solutions, um, and uh, and uh, yeah, and, and so this is something that we uh, that we uh, would also do. Uh, so go uh, proactively go uh, and uh, um, train uh, our our own colleagues that work in, in other uh, like uh, yeah like medical uh, centers like. Um, uh, like the the CPIs, I, I, I don't know how, how how to say that in English, but um, uh, but also uh, make it uh, um, uh, strengthen also the the capacities and and um, raise awareness of what is prostitution uh, towards our our um, sister organizations. Great. Um, now we are moving on to the to the second part of this discussion. Unfortunately, um, it places quite a contrast with the, the very positive and marvelous help that Isala offers to to prostituted women or women that are now out of prostitution. Um, but I think that it's important for for the audience and for people who don't live in Belgium or even for those who live in Belgium and are not very much connected to to the issue. Um, if we could have a sort of, you know, state of the art around what is happening in Belgium. Um, because Belgium has been described in the past as pimp paradise, so a paradise for people who, who exploit uh, as a criminal activity women and, and men as well sometimes uh, in prostitution. So I was wondering, Piahet, if you could give us an overview of what is the system that is put, uh, that is in place in Belgium how does it work? Um, so yeah, let's start by that, and then Mireya will tell us more about what is happening right now at political level and at the grassroots level as well regarding the the situation that Pierrette will expose. So, Pierrette, the floor is yours. Thank you, and it's funny because before creating Isela with a with a with a small group of activists, we did an open letter, and indeed we qualified Belgium as a, a paradise for pimps. And so I'm going to explain why. Um, so Belgium has signed, ratified um, the 1949 Convention of the United Nations uh, aimed at uh, repressing trafficking and, and prostitution. Uh, so officially in its uh, current penal code, so before it's going to be changed, uh, Belgium um, uh, considers that women of, and men victims of prostitution are victims victims of pimping are victims and is supposed to provide services. Uh, and we're going to talk about that because that's not the case. And at the same time, the same text says that all forms of pimping have to be criminalized. So this is what was put uh, in the penal code in Belgium in 1960, um, which is quite good. Uh, but uh, in the 90s, there was a first change. So the 90s are uh, globally the, the years of uh, ultra-liberal policies, um, just to make the link with the global <laughs> situation. And so in Belgium, uh, it was decided, it was changed when it comes to uh, what we would call um, 
like uh, housing pimping. So when you are the owner of a building and you rent part of your building for activities linked to prostitution, if the benefit you make from it is not abnormal, Belgium says it's okay. So clearly abnormal in a legal term is very blurry. So it doesn't mean anything. You can interpret it the way you want. And if you look at just the reality, so Belgium has windows, uh, which can be um, very shocking for people who have no windows in their own countries. So windows means that you have women um, behind the window on the, on the street, uh, often uh, almost naked and um, so you can see them and you can enter and then you can buy sex. Uh, in this uh, street of windows in Brussels, uh, you have four women per day, which are uh, on those windows. And each of them have to pay 200 euros per day to be in the window. So can you imagine what it means? It means for each woman, it's 200 per day multiplied by 30 days uh, a month. And for the owners, it means he gets, uh, and I'm <laughs> purposely saying he, he gets 1,000 euros per day, which means at the end of the month, 30 days, 30,000 euros for the ground floor of a building. Do you believe this is a normal <laughs> rent? It's not. Of course, um, everybody knows it. The woman told us the amount they pay. Um, and the police and the legal systems are doing nothing in Belgium to make that change. They could at least intervene because those windows are supposed to be bars. But if you get there, there's no bar. There's no waitress, waiter. There's nothing. So just for the... Uh, labor law, it should be closed. But of course, it's not. Uh, you have street prostitution in Belgium too. And uh, Isala goes on the streets and they, they, they meet the women there and they feel the atmosphere. The atmosphere is very tense. You have the pimps and the small, the small, the big pimps. You know, there's different level of pimps and we see them and they are there. Uh, there's, a, there's an interesting anecdote of uh, one day, one of the duo of Isala was on the streets and the police came to see our volunteers and said to the volunteers, oh, be careful, you have the Bulgarian pimps around. And the volunteers were like, okay, but you do nothing? No, 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 but they are there. Okay, so you can see how um, the police considers that uh, it's okay to leave the system uh, like this because they hope they will catch you know, the very big fish who is doing the big, big mega trafficking. But the reality is that, of course, there are super big networks, very violent networks in Belgium. And I heard stories when I was going to the um, uh, asylum uh, seeker centers to train the, the, the social workers in the centers. I heard stories of super violent networks. But you also have all the small uh, like mafia and the police just lets them happen. And we met women on the streets who were badly beaten. It was terrible. And the police know, but just waits uh, to get even worse. So they're really sacrificing women to get to the point of, uh, of finding the big fish. And we are very shocked because um, if you just um, give impunity to the everyday pimps, you allow uh, for a lot of small pimps to be there. And, uh, and, and the reality is that it's very difficult to catch the very big mafia. Um, and so Belgium indeed for, for us is um, paradise of ping ping because there is this mentality that uh, uh, that it's okay to see prostitution because the police is focused and obsessed by trafficking and doesn't want to see the link with prostitution while we know that trafficking exists only for the purpose of putting women in the prostitution system if there were no prostitution systems windows whatever there would be no trafficking you traffic people to put them where then you sell them and then where you benefit. It's the same for any form of trafficking. So trafficking should not be the main goal. The main goal should be the, the market. And of course, if you stop the market, then the trafficking by itself would disappear, which is what uh, Sweden has seen when uh, it targeted the market through the criminalization of uh, the sex buyers. And um, in Belgium, there's also, uh, just to show you how there's normalization uh, of prostitution led uh, uh, in two cities in Wallonia. There was the idea to create a municipal brothel uh, because uh, they wanted to uh, make the, the, the the area around the, the train station better but that's where you had uh, the prostitution streets and you had like 150 women there older women uh, and uh, what do we do with them oh let's create a brothel and let's put them there and they will have a nice place to kind of work 
but uh, the amount of money put in there and also how the, the, the risk that the municipality is taking by becoming a pimp, an official pimp, uh, should be compared to what the city could have done with the same money for uh, reintegration programs for those women could be uh, giving them like a minimum wage or a minimum uh, social allocation um, to have like a decent life and not finding a, a very strange solution that would be that those women would have done prostitution for more 10 years and then they would have stopped and what do you do then you would have to 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 full like to put women, new women in that brothel and uh, would they have done like uh, opening calls for belgium young women to get in so it's really um the state of mind in belgium is really uh, into a pragmatic situation which doesn't want to look at the whole system and doesn't want to um, understand the links between trafficking, prostitution, the global criminal system and male violence in general and how it links with everyday male violence. So it's it's a pity because um, um, Belgium says that they are very strong on trafficking, uh, which is still to be, to be um, uh, validated, but at the same time, any form of uh, advocacy measures that uh, the women's rights ministers and all type of um, governments are going to do will have no substance if they don't address prostitution because it means they're going to keep a space for male violence to continue and at the same time they're going to make big discourse about uh, sexual harassment in the street and domestic violence which makes no sense because we see it every day it's the women are facing all of that and uh, you cannot stop one violence without stopping all of them. So, uh, and the last thing I wanted to say is that with the COVID, um, when uh, the COVID went, came to Belgium, so Isala was doing a lot of work online by phone to support the women. And we started to see um, a narrative in Belgium saying that uh, if the so-called sex workers had um, uh, a status as a worker, everything would change. But as Mireya was saying, what we see is that majority of women are uh, not Belgium. Uh, so they don't have access to the basic like social allocation because Belgium have. And uh, if they are European, they have to find a job to, to keep their legal status. And if they are outside of Europe, they have no access to um, the territory unless they have a visa, which means that there is an employer that wants to employ them. And the reality is that it's the legal status that give access to the rights and having a status of a worker wouldn't change anything. A woman from Albania will not be able to have the status of worker if nobody gives a visa for her to come. And because what the sex worker lobby wants to is uh, an independent um, status, there is no way a uh, woman would have um, access to entering the territory and to get the, the legal migration status. So we need to make sure we don't have this uh, mix between migration and prostitution. And the last thing I want to say is that um, when we talk to the woman, they clearly say that if they have, the first thing they want is a job, a normal job, as they say. And they know the job will give them the, the legal status, but they want to keep the, the job when they have the legal status. None of them say, oh, as soon as I've got my Belgian paper, I'm going to go back to prostitution because it's so much better to be prostitution while being Belgian. No, they want to have a normal life. And clearly it's a myth to make us believe that uh, a legal status, the regulation of uh, pimping will uh, will help. Uh, and Miria will tell us more about how you can regulate pimping in a very, very manipulative way. Uh, bef before we hear from Mireya, I was just wondering how would you both respond? Because right now in the, in the first wave of COVID that we had in Belgium, uh, prostitution was prohibited. So it means that the women who were in windows and the women who were on the street uh, could not, you know, um, do, let's say, for lack of a better word, uh, this act of prostitution. Uh, so the, the pro-prostitution lobby in Belgium right now as well, because we have a new prohibition of prostitution because of this third or fourth wave of COVID that we have, um, they said that if we regulate prostitution, not if we regulate the status of, of, the, um, of the woman, but if we regulate prostitution uh, as an activity, then this would... Um, then women wouldn't be starving or facing these economic difficulties that they are facing now. Um, what is your response to this? Uh, 
So when we say regulate prostitution, let's be clear what it means. For them, it means that you decriminalize pimping, that you don't consider the pimps as criminals, but they are employers. And uh, in Belgium, it's not prohibited to be in prostitution. The women are not criminalized for being in prostitution. Um, what is criminalized is pimping, and that's what is at risk. If it's not criminalized anymore, it means that um, pimping is legal, and then you have uh, women who will be exploited um, by pimps. Uh, so if they were, uh, I mean, the COVID was prohibiting people from having close relationship like you do when you go to a massage, when you go to sports, when you do uh, any type of sport. So there was no specific discrimination against women, against people in prostitution during COVID. It was a regulation for everyone. And I think we need to make it clear. There's no reason why suddenly this sector of society could continue while all the rest was prohibited and we were all stuck at home. And some of the women were super shocked that the buyers would call them despite the virus circulating. They were super scared, but the men don't give it. They don't care. They still like this is also interesting to understand the mentality of men. They don't care. They don't care about the virus. They don't care that they're going to give it to everybody just because they still want their power having access to a woman. Um, so clearly, uh, having a, a, like a statute like say that say that um, you regulate wouldn't change first the COVID situation because COVID was for everybody, and it wouldn't change the um, situation of women uh, in the sense that. Um, uh, that's very interesting. If you regulate pimping, it means that you accept, uh, you have to create a, a contract between the persons, like any like remunerated work. And that's where it becomes interesting and to see whether you can create a contract which says that a person has to be obliged to have sexual intercourse uh, with people and that the money doesn't go to them. You know, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting contract in terms of uh, labor law. Uh, it means that uh, a woman signs a contract with a person to ask money for somebody else to give back the money. If you sign a contract, normally you are paid directly by your boss for the work you're doing and you're performing a work for your boss. In that case, the work starts when a third person comes in and pays you directly or the PIMS and in enters your body integrity. And that would create a lot of problem with the laws against sexual harassment at work because they would just be useless in that case, and do we want that? Thank you. And now on to Mireia. Uh, could you explain us then what is at stake right now in Belgium? Uh, what is this reform of the criminal code that everybody is talking about, but nobody really understands the, the, really in the implications? Uh, if you could share that with us, that would be great. Thank you. Yes, indeed. So, so right now there is a, a law that it's been debated in the parliament. We don't know when this law will be voted. We know that it will be soon, in the coming weeks, in the coming months. Um, that it, we've been um, we've been uh, trying at least to uh, to um, make our our analysis heard since the beginning of the year, and we are very concerned because this law, what it does is it decriminalizes pimping, and how how does it do, how does it do that? Um, as as Pierre say. Say, said uh, nowadays being in prostitution is not punished by the law pimping is punished by the law right so this this new uh, this new law what will, what uh, what it does is redefine pimping um in a, in a way where we have um where we uh, separate we we distinguish two two types of pimping like a good pimping and a bad pimping right um, there is, uh, there is um, uh, now, if this law passes, the uh, only pimping that will be punished is the pimping that obtains an abnormal profit from the prostitution of another person. So the good pimping is the one, is the pimp that takes a normal profit and the bad pimp is uh, uh, the pimp that takes an abnormal profit. For this, uh, for, for us, this distinction, it, it, it doesn't really make sense, right? Because for us, any profit that uh, a person obtains from the prostitution of other person is uh, uh, is um, is uh, exploitation, right? It's sexual exploitation. Um, so, um, so as long as uh, the pimp will will take a normal profit, he will be considered just as a businessman. 
and uh, there will be no way to, to convict him. Um, he will continue to sexually exploit uh, women and girls uh, that are victims of prostitution, and it will be legal. So this, uh, this uh, women won't be able to, uh, uh, to uh, make a complaint. They won't be able to, uh, to go after their, their perpetrators. Um, so, so this is this is very problematic. Um, as Pierrette was saying, um, the, the the idea behind this this law is that uh, there is human trafficking on the one side, and there is chosen prostitution uh, on the other side, and that both elements don't, doesn't have don't have anything to do. Uh, but we uh, we we know that. There, there's, there is not uh, such difference. Human trafficking is what fits markets uh, of prostitution and the, on the on the sex um, and the prostitution industry, right? Um, and uh, this all the whole this whole thing is being uh, is being sold as uh, as so much progress uh, for women's rights and uh, so much progress for uh, um, for sex workers. Um, it's it's um, yeah. So, so we've tried to make uh, we've tried to make um, Isela's analysis heard. Uh, we've been uh, in a hearing in October um, in the Parliament with the Commission of Justice, and right now we're just waiting for some news to see um, to see uh, uh, how it goes. But indeed, we are uh, we are very um, uh, very worried because. Uh, Belgium is really making a choice with this law. It's really uh, taking a direction. We uh, are moving towards um, the system that we see in uh, Germany, for instance, with big, uh, big infrastructures of uh, prostitution, uh, uh, prostitution places. And for the uh, frontline organizations, this is going to be also a problem because what will happen with people that are in the streets? We see at the same time that this law is debated that um, the, um, the, uh, the city of Brussels has bought several, uh, several prostitution places in, in the neighborhood where we are, where this ally is, is located. Um, I mean, this is this is outrageous, right? Because they are giving, first of all, they are giving money to the to the brother owners instead of just closing up the place. Uh, and second, I mean, where are going all these women that are today in the street? How will be uh, how we will will we be able to get in touch with them? Um, so so um, it is not just about. Uh, chosen prostitution or not chosen prostitution is really about uh, a project of, of society that Belgium will will decide and will it's going to choose with this um, with this law. And connected to that, how how has it been to? Um, no, maybe a better question. Why do you think that this reform of this law is? passing through the cracks, because I cannot imagine this happening in a country such as France or other countries. I feel like this, this question has been quite suffocated. Um, do you have any insight as, as, to, as to why most of people in Belgium don't know that this is happening, or it took a long time to understand why? Um, what, we've, uh, what we have sensed is that um, the, the law, or at least at the beginning of, that, uh, of, the, of the project, uh, no one knew that this was happening, first of all. So they have worked on the text with, uh, together with really uh, um, uh, certain groups that carry out a, a single analysis of prostitution. The frontline organizations, the feminist organizations weren't consulted uh, for this. So it also brings questions about the democratic, um, the democratic, uh, uh, um, the democratic elements of, of, of the, this whole process. And then um, there is also um, there is also I think that there is a lot of misunderstanding of what is prostitution. There is a lot, a lot of misunderstanding of, of what is the situation currently in Belgium. And uh, and to be honest, uh, the role of, of uh, media and big media outlets in Belgium hasn't been hasn't been very helpful. Uh, we have tried to uh, we have tried to reach out to the to the um, to the general media, but we haven't received any responses either. And mostly, the the, the analysis that is shared is only an individualistic analysis of 
of prostitution based on individual choices, based on uh, individual needs, and and um, there is very uh, there is a huge lack of, of a systemic analysis uh, as Pierrette was was presenting uh, before. This doesn't mean that this doesn't mean that the uh, that we haven't mobilized ourselves in order to raise awareness about these projects, and and uh, whoever is interested in in knowing what's what's going on, uh, there are mobilizations that are still going on. Uh, you can join us. You can speak about it. You can um, uh, you can yourself uh, 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 look at the resources that are that are the the, the open letters that are um, that you can find on the internet and uh, and join us in this uh, in this battle. Yes, I have uh, left the the resources. They are most of them are in French, but uh, I guess that they are translated in in other languages. Um, and yes, Pierre, do you have anything else to add to what uh, Mireya said? No, no, it's clearly. Um, uh, of course, the, the the contexts are different from one country to the other, but. Um, uh, Belgium also, I think, suffers from uh, the complexity of its administrative system. The fact that uh, it's there are so many uh, levels of power uh, creates less action, uh, or it's more difficult to take action because you have to consult so many levels. Uh, the national one, then you have the regions, then you have the, the communities, then you have the, the commune. What the main message Isela was saying is that uh, addressing prostitution, sexual exploitation, pimping, trafficking, it's a federal competence and it should be addressed from the federal level. So when the commune, like the, the, the municipalities are trying to do something, often the, the, the state council will um, uh, reject what they are doing because that's not their competence. Whether they try to say prostitution is only in this street or this house, whether they want to criminalize the women in the streets, it will be cancelled by the highest level because it's not the, the right level of competence. And that's why we're saying it should, there should be um, harmony, harmonized federal action. Otherwise, it's left to the municipalities to try to find a solution with prostitution on their streets. And often they try just to pull it just uh, at the border with the other commune. Or uh, they try what I was mentioning, municipal um, buildings where they feel it's going to be better because it's uh, all under control on the same building. But at the end of the day, they don't look at the deeper problem and they don't understand that Belgium has become a bit of a, a hub for prostitution. When we see uh, the nationalities of the women, the language they speak, a uh, woman from uh, um, uh, Romania, uh, Albania speaking Greek and, and Spanish, women from Morocco speaking Spanish, women from uh, Albania speaking Italian, like, you clearly see that uh, you can see the roads of trafficking and we see them changing, we see new arrivals in September, we see, we see that and they have to address that. It's an international issue and uh, and they don't play their part because they just uh, leave it. Uh, they don't take responsibility. So it's good at the same time that there, there, there's a debate in Belgium and uh, the penal code reform has been started uh, from a very administrative perspective. And that's also, uh, I guess, because of this administrative way of working in Belgium. But clearly, uh, there's a lack of public debate. There's a lack of uh, parliamentarians uh, taking their role of parliamentarians and making hearings with uh, with associations, with survivors. And, uh, and they don't really do that. And they believe it's going to pass like this, you know, administratively speaking. And that's very worrying in terms of democracy in Belgium. Just to touch upon what you said uh, as we are moving closer to the end, um, I once had um, a comment by a man in Belgium saying that there's no survivors of prostitution in Belgium. And we shouldn't be speaking for them. Uh, the truth is that Isala sees those survivors every day. They accompany them every day. And just because these women don't give, you know, their public voice uh, to the world doesn't mean that they didn't survive something. Um, but those who give, um, we have put here in the in the chat uh, a testimony of of a, of a Belgian survivor. And uh, there's also a. Um, a video by the made in conjunction with the European Women's Lobby at the time that uh, Pierrette was there uh, on uh, a lot of Belgian survivors. For, for example, we have Pascal Rouge, we have Maite Lone. Uh, those are addressed in the video. I will put them in, in the chat for you. Okay. I want to, regarding that, I want to say that, that we have not heard during the hearings any uh, of the Belgian survivors or 
uh, of any survivor uh, survivors from any like, other country. Uh, whereas uh, the uh, uh, the sex workers uh, uh, labor union uh, was was there has been very present in the drafting of the text. So this is also very problematic. Where are the victims of prostitution in the uh, um, in this whole uh, process? Go ahead. Thank you. Um, no, I was just looking for the link while while you were talking. Um, as we are approaching the end, that I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, I was just going to ask you um, for a final statement. It doesn't have to be positive per se, because we know that prostitution is nothing uh, close to positive. But I would ask you to maybe, as last words, why why do you think it's important for you to be um, here today to call to talk about this specific violence, even though we stated before that this violence cannot be disconnected from the analysis that, that we give to other violences. But yes, I basically just wanted to, to ask you for a final statement, positive, negative, uh, whatever you are, you are, you are free to choose your own words. Mireya, you want to go first this time? Okay. <laughs> um, I think, uh, I think that's um, what's important to, to, um, uh, to, it's important to be here today because uh, we need to recall that, uh, um, in order to uh, acknowledge that prostitution is a system of violence, we need to recognize all the forms uh, in which this violence takes place. And, and this is very true for this uh, new law that Belgium is debating. We need to punish all forms of pimping. It's not, uh, it, it, it won't make any sense to punish just one form of pimping because that would say that we are sacri sacrificing um, uh, some women for the sake of. Uh, uh, for the for the desires and the and the will of of another group, right? And for me, my my last word would be about um, listening and believing. Uh, I think, as Mireya said, it's important to listen to survivors. We cannot uh, change laws and whatever if we don't hear from the persons who've been the victims. And this is what happened when the laws uh, changed about domestic violence. There were uh, a real work from the feminist organization listening to the women victims of domestic violence. And even though those women didn't want to speak out, the feminist groups were there to bring their voices and make sure that uh, everybody understand and, and, and really support them. Um, because it's not always easy to have survivors speak out because, and that I come to believing, because they feel they are not believed. And in societies where uh, the voice of women is not believed, especially in society where prostitution is so normalized, the voice of prostitution survivors are not believed. They don't dare to speak out and they don't feel that they're going to be listened to and that there will be action. So we can do as much exit programs and uh, providing food uh, uh, support and whatever, if society is not clearly stating that prostitution is a form of violence and that we believe them, we trust them, that they are victims and we're going to do everything to give them the status of victim because that status gives access to housing, to, to money allocation and to residence permit. We can do whatever we want. Uh, the abolition of prostitution has to come with the acknowledgement by society that this is violence. And all the little, which are important, exit programs and food and whatever, it's important, education programs. But if they are not linked to a real support from society, it will not uh, make women trust that we really care for them. So that would be my, my last word, listen to survivor, trust women's voices, and listen uh, from the front line. Thank you both for those words. Um, maybe to end this conversation, I would ask you, Mireya, uh, say if somebody is watching this um, this this live and they want to uh, to contribute to Isala's work, uh, how may they do that? Who do they write to? What can we say to the audience? Yes, uh, we welcome. Um, volunteer applications uh, every year so please uh, if you want to take action um, if it's uh, uh, we, we, we are very open uh, to, to any type of collaboration um, please contact us I can leave uh, an email for instance in the in the chat um, so isala uh, um, so please contact us uh, through uh, that email address or through our Facebook page. Um, we are also on Twitter. 
Uh, so uh, we will. Uh, one of our members will uh, will reply, and and um, we will uh, be happy to uh, to exchange with you. And if I may, uh, Isela is really a really safe and uh, and nice place. It's not just about a. Uh, supporting women, but also uh, having an environment to share uh, your feelings. And it's important that uh, to know that uh, Isala cares a lot for the volunteers. So just don't hesitate to join Isala and to be part of change. Exactly. To be a part of this change, you, you need to be heard of when you, when you are dealing with such uh, difficult experiences and with the lived realities of, of women both out and in prostitution. So, so yeah, that's a that's a very good conclusion. Um, I wanted to thank you very much both for, for being here with me tonight, for taking the time, uh, for alerting us. This is kind of a whistleblowing uh, activity that we are doing here today. And it's very important for us as a society, as women, to, to know what is happening at our local level. Uh, so we are also more prepared also to see the best practices of other countries. Biaret mentioned Sweden, but there's a great work uh, being done in France and even in countries where prostitution, um, where the issue of prostitution has not been met with uh, an abolitionist law. Um, so thank you both for the incredible work that you do. Um, on behalf of the European Network of Migrant Women, we are very happy to, to have such an organization as ISALA uh, within our membership. And we hope, um, we hope that this... Um, yeah, I was going to say we hope that this collaboration continues, but uh, we know we know it will. Obvious for the for the bad reasons, but we we appreciate your work and and thank you for being part of of the feminist movement. <laughs> thank you, Adriana, for organizing and inviting us. You are yeah. welcome. Thanks. Many, Bye. Many thanks. Bye. Have a great Bye. night. Take care. <laughs> you too.